Next on Startup, I'm going to DC to meet with Caroline, who started Righteous Cheese, a small artisan cheese shop that's educating locals about cheese from around the world. Then I'm going to New York City to meet with Constance, who created Hot Girls Pearls, custom body cooling jewelry that helps women cope with hot flashes. And finally, we're going to Ferndale, Michigan to talk with Berkey, who created Four Chamber Forge, a company that turns scrapped wood into unique handmade jewelry. All of this and more is next on Startup. The entrepreneurial spirit is alive and well. In Walsh College's business launch entrepreneurial community, consultants provide advice to aspiring business starters. More information available online. The Chevrolet Volt, an everyday electric car with gas for longer trips. The nature of things to come. Oh, Chevrolet, find new roads. American Express is proud to support Startup and the millions of small businesses that put in the hard work to be open for business in neighborhoods across the country. My name is Gary Bredo, and I'm a documentary filmmaker and an entrepreneur. The economy is in less than perfect shape, and when the jobs go away, there's nothing left to do but get up and get creative. And there are people all over America doing just that. It's estimated that up to 85% of new businesses fail, so I'm going coast to coast to hear the personal stories of the people who beat the odds and started a successful business from the ground up. This is Startup. I'm on Neil Place at the Union Market in Washington, D.C., and we're going to talk to Carolyn, who created Righteous Cheese. Now, Carolyn swore to herself that she would never open a cheese shop, but it looks like this cheesemonger is about to be rolling in cheddar. Let's go hear her story. Following a two-year downturn, the cheese market is bouncing back steadily, growing at 6.1% in 2011 and reaching total U.S. retail sales of $18.9 billion. The positive trend is expected to continue as consumers take interest in better for you options, creative flavors, and their support for sustainability. Caroline, owner and operator of Righteous Cheese, is on the front lines of the cheese marketplace. She believes that every cheese has a story from farm to table. Her passion? To bring these unique and uncommon tastes and flavors to local DC food lovers. I wanna know who, who you are yeah. and your history before becoming the Righteous Cheese Queen. My first word was cheese. Was it really? Yeah, it was really. Was somebody taking a picture? Um, no, my mom just claims this. She could be making it up. Um, I started getting into food um, in college. I worked in restaurants. One of the restaurants I worked at had this great, amazing cheese program. And I just, no pun intended, I really devoured it and really got into it. And so the front of the house was responsible for making cheese plates. And some of my coworkers would make the cheese plates not terribly well, so I did everyone's cheese plates. And I ended up serving a cheese plate to one of the owners of Cowgirl Creamery, and I found out they were opening shop here in D.C., and I said, I want to work for you. You know, whenever you open, I'll do whatever. I just want to learn about cheese. So I got the opportunity to work for them just part-time for fun. What did you learn? Where did that take you? Did it just open your mind to new dimensions with cheese? Or It did. I had no idea. All the questions you're asking me about, you know, what's the difference between all these different types of cheese, I had no idea. I thought I knew about food, and I knew nothing. You knew nothing? Yeah. I mean, I think that cheese tells us so much about who we are as people. You know, you, you go to a town in Italy, and they have a cheese that they make during a certain festival every year. Um, and that's what identifies their town. I think it's really interesting. The United States produced 4,275 metric tons of cheese in 2012. Educate me on this place that, we're, that we are. This is an artisan food vendor market. Um, we have a butcher shop that's been operating for years and years and years. We have mm -hmm. a couple different local produce vendors and farmers. We have Border Springs Farm, which is a lamb farmer from Southern Virginia. We have Rappahannock Oyster Bar, which is a company that revitalized the aquaculture of the Chesapeake Bay, which is really exciting. Wow. Peregrine Espresso, which has won all sorts of competitions around the country for their coffees and espressos. Leon Bakery, a local bread baker. We have a little local wine shop, a restaurant, a little chocolate shop. Um, so this place is growing all the time. What, how do you feel about being in here? It's a lot of fun. I think you know the if you look at all the different vendors in here, it, you know it's it's a little something for everybody. You know it's not like say you don't 
eat oysters, you can come here and eat cheese. You don't eat cheese, you go over there and eat meat. You know, it's yeah. got everything. It's got everything from like an old school soda bar to a uh, you know an Amish dairy farm. You know, it's really a good group of people. When did you get righteous? Um, I started my own business prior to this one. Um, doing more consulting. So I left working for somebody else, which I didn't really love that much, and started on my own, teaching wine and cheese classes, teaching beer and cheese classes, doing consulting, doing private events. And I was contacted by the um, owners of this market, and they asked if I wanted to open a cheese shop. And I had never really wanted to before. I had always thought, we have good enough cheese shops in the city, I don't need to do retail. But the whole concept of the market was really exciting to me. I knew a lot of the other purveyors that were opening in here, and I really believed in what they were doing and had a lot of respect for what they made. And then it also gave me the opportunity to open my bar. And at the bar, I thought we can do some really great cheese and wine and cheese and beer yeah. pairings and introduce people to something new, like really cool tastes that they haven't had before. Yeah. And we have here at the shop about 80 or 90 different cheeses, and we're always rotating them. We always have new things coming in. There's so many, so many different types of cheese made around the world that it does take almost a curator to present those to you know our public that want to learn and taste new things. Let's do some cheese. You want to see how to Let's do it. open a cheese up? Use Stuff one hand in. to hold the cheese. Yeah, that's fine. And then the other hand, just pull back and down. Yep. It's perfect. And then let go. So I'm a formagier now. Yes, now you're a formagier. U.S. per capita consumption of natural cheese increased by 0.36 pounds over the 2010 amount reaching a level of 33.5 pounds, the second highest amount ever on record. So we do classes every Thursday for the most part, and every month I vary the theme. We'll do a cheese and wine class one month, and the cheese and beer class the next month, and so on. Does each individual vendor have to have their own beer and wine license, liquor license, or does it fall under the umbrella of Union Market? Um, each individual vendor has to have their own everything, their own certificate of occupancy, their own liquor license, their own health inspection, their own food handler's licenses. Everything is indiv individually, independently run businesses. What was your total, I guess, budget to start this business? Well, um, one of the things that I negotiated with my lease was having the landlord do some of the build out. And that was really key for us, to not have to do those upfront costs. And then the other thing, you know, because we opened our bar before the retail shop, we didn't have to have quite as much inventory. That was helpful. Um, initially, I had some friends and family loans. I applied for a bank loan, but the interest was so high, I just couldn't see a way of making it work. And a filmmaker friend of mine had successfully financed a film that he was making and through Kickstarter. And I thought, you know, that we might as well give it a shot. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And if it does, then that's perfect. So um, I raised about 45000 uh, through friends and family loans and about fifteen through Kickstarter. And that gave us a nice cushion. Um, that's so that, incredible. $60,000 yeah. you raised without a bank loan. Yeah, without a bank loan. It was really amazing, especially with Kickstarter. The unintended result that has been wonderful is seeing the response from the community. People that I didn't know and had never met who wanted a cheese shop in their city, and that was really cool. How much of a, of a part has has your website and social media played in this business? Social media is even a, a bigger part of our business than web, the website is, honestly. Um, especially with Kickstarter, getting the word out through Facebook and Twitter um, was amazing. It, it's incredible to me, every time I post a photo on Instagram, people respond to it. So that's definitely a way that we've been able to communicate with our customers. They can ask us a question via Twitter and we can answer right away. So that's been really helpful. What advice do you have for other would-be entrepreneurs out there? It's really dedicating yourself to always improving what you're doing and never be content with um, the status quo. Thank you so much for talking to me. I really appreciate it. Was it was a pleasure. And best of luck with your business. Although it may be okay to have holes in your Swiss cheese, your business plan has to be rock solid. Caroline took her passion for cheese and she's creating a monster name for herself all around the D.C. area. For more information, log on to our website and click the link for Righteous Cheese. I'm on 58th Street and 1st Avenue in New York City. Now I'm going to go talk to Connie, who created Hot Girls Pearls. Now after 12 years of hot flashes, Connie finally decided to take matters into her own hands. Let's go find out how she's helping women all over the world stay cool and look hot. According to U.S. Census data, 
There are over 45 million women in the U.S. who are either menopausal or postmenopausal. Additionally, there are an estimated 500,000 women who have experienced premature natural menopause. Constant search for a solution to cool her overheating body after a cancer scare and a bad reaction to a prescription drug. Her solution was to turn a necklace of ice cubes into a lovely strand of classic looking pearls. Hence, the creation of Hot Girls Pearls was born, providing menopausal and overheating women all over the world a unique treatment option for hot flashes. I want to know about you as a person. Tell me a story. Well, once upon a time, <laughs> I was one of those people growing up in the 60s that did not have a real plan for life. <laughs> you know, I just floated in and I had lots of jobs that sound glamorous. It sounded great on the outside, mm -hmm. but it s sucked. What sucked about well, it? Well, I was not a good employee, for one thing. <laughs> I can relate. Yeah, I wasn't good with taking orders, and I really thought corporate stuff was silly. I was, at 47 years old, put on a medication called tamoxifen, which is used for breast cancer patients. I was put on it as a preventative, and they put me on it, and I immediately turned into the towering inferno. And I can't constantly be a shut-in living with my air conditioner blowing in my face all the time. Right. So I said, you know, I got to wear ice cubes around my neck. So I went down the street and I bought some. I bought some plastic ice cubes and some string yeah. and scotch tape. And I stuck it in the freezer and I tied it when it was done. And I said, you know, that feels pretty good, but <laughs> probably the, the look might not be there. Let's talk about the actual production part of it. Okay. Pearls themselves are made overseas. Okay. I tried to have them made over here. So I would try to contact companies and say, give me a chance with this. You know, let's keep sure. this here. Yes. Yeah. Didn't want to talk to me, didn't want to hear about it. You tried. Me. You know, that was your responsibility, right? So This guy who I worked with, the one who made the prototypes in this, mm -hmm. he has factories over in China that he works with, so he became Point man. How did this? How did this get to market? Um, you got the packaging. You have the manufacturing. So how do you sell them? There's this really cute girl on the Today Show who loves to introduce new products. Mm -hmm. So I just sent her an email. I got an email back from her assistant asking if I lived in the city and if I had samples. I said yes and yes. Mm -hmm. And. A couple of weeks later, there they were on the Today Show. I mean, we went from $400 in sales to $13,000 in sales in that one day. Then we did a gift show in New York, the first gift show we ever tried. And the first half hour that we were there, Adam Glassman, who's the creative director for Oprah's Magazine, came by and fell in love and said he was gonna definitely get us on the O list. And so a few weeks later, I'm on a cruise with my mom and my sisters, and we're in St. Martin, and I'm having lunch with some friends who live down there in the winter. And a woman at the restaurant turns around and she says, are those hot girls pearls? What? Yeah, no kidding. And she said, well, I just saw Whoopi Goldberg wearing them on The View. Had no idea. And I was shaking like I was in St. Vitus dance. I was like, <laughs> it was fabulous and a nightmare because we had the O-list was out at the same time mm. as Whoopi on The View. It went insane. It's estimated that 2 million women in 2010 had undergone surgery or another medical procedure leading to menopause. Welcome to the Warehouse Fulfillment <laughs> Center. Excellent, this is gorgeous. Of the world's headquarters of Hot Girls Pearls. <laughs> After okay. the orders are taken through the magic of the computer, mm -hmm. okay. then we move the data processor <laughs> to another spot because this is where the crew who handles fulfillment comes in. Oh, the fulfillment crew, okay. We so. have inventory control over here and we okay. start doing the old line of setting up the boxes, yeah. putting in the tissue paper, because we like to send them out real nice like. Mm -hmm. So you don't it's need a big warehouse, on. a big factory, you don't need an office. Well, you know you what the advantage the is when you have your own control of things is that you know that it's, if, if, 
it's going to be done right because the people who actually care about it are putting it together. There's so many people out there that, that end up working jobs that they, you know, that they're not passionate about, doing things that they're yeah. not passionate about. That's sad. For a long time. Uh, what, do you, what do you say to those, those people that could possibly be in that situation right now? I say you absolutely owe it to yourself. In some way, at whatever level you can start something that's for your own, that you love, you've got to do it. Mm -hmm. This is your only life. This is the one time you're going around this way. Yeah. You have to do it. You have to. Otherwise, it'll eat you up inside. And hopefully you have people around you that can support you and help you and love you and, you know, give you a good hug and let you know it's going to work out. It'll be okay. Tomorrow isn't guaranteed. For anybody. It doesn't matter who you are, what sure. you have. Well, thank you so much uh, for your time. We really appreciate you telling us your story. Oh, I'm really glad I got to. So it really doesn't matter what stage of life you're in. If you have a really good idea, you should never put it on ice. Although Connie no longer has time to chill, she's created a business that has completely changed the course of her life. For more information, log on to our website and click the link for Hot Girls Pearls. I'm on Woodland in Ferndale, Michigan, and we're gonna go talk to Berkey, who created Four Chamber Forge. Now, Berkey learned at an early age that a paycheck was never gonna be worth sacrificing your happiness. So he dropped everything and created this incredible business making handmade wood, steel, and leather merchandise. Let's go hear his story. The craft and hobby industry holds eight categories. Of those categories, there are 53 segments. Woodworking is the most profitable of the 53 segments, taking in $3.32 billion in sales in 2010. Berkey grew up in a family of makers and has worked with his hands from a very young age. He discovered his passion for jewelry making after carving a wooden ring for a co-worker, which became popular amongst locals and turned one simple gesture into a profitable business. Where'd you go to school? Well, I went to school in Berkeley School Districts and got into computer science, building computers, doing that whole thing. Got into Kettering during my senior year. So Explain to people what Kettering is. Kettering is uh, General Motors Institute, is what it used to be called. It's an engineering school. It's work study, so they do three months of class, three months at a full-time job. They got me a job, started working doing computer science, and realized I could make money doing it, but it wasn't gonna make me happy. It was a job. You were separating bolts. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so um, luckily I was enrolled at Wayne State. So the day before classes started, I signed up at Wayne State for anthropology. <laughs> and after a couple of years of doing anthropology at Wayne State, I loved it. But it's, you know, the question again, it was, I love doing this, but what will I have to do to make money doing it? And so I took the rest of the money that I was going to, that I had saved for college and bought this house and turned the, the rickety garage into a workshop. My parents basically, you know, we had money, but my mom was used to like squeezing blood out of a stone. <laughs> and so, yeah, my, we always had tools. My dad would always make stuff. That's how we solve problems in the house. When you say solve problems, you mean like uh, inner, inner family type? No, issues, no, or? <laughs> we didn't need tools for that, but well, an outlet. You know? Yeah, or, you know, we bought a new TV, and so my dad built a TV stand and incorporated some videotape storage, and it was just the idea that we knew what we needed, and we could probably solve the problem better than any store or, any, or cheaper. And so it was fun, because we always had the tools around, and my dad's policy was, he'd answer any questions, and if I got hurt, I was in trouble. So, you know, this is, how, this is a power saw, this is how it works. If you cut yourself, you're not allowed to use it anymore. Oh, no. So, so, so you learned real quick. <laughs> yeah. The lax uh, rules in Detroit allowed me mm -hmm. to put a coal forge in my backyard <laughs> and, you know, scoured some, some scrap metal and started just kind of banging on things and just the way my dad taught me. just. So a coal forge really shouldn't be in a residential no, area. No, a so. coal forge should not be in a residential <laughs> area. It's just blend right in in like River Rouge area yeah, or something. Yeah, or Detroit. yeah. It was uh, made out of an old brake drum. And so you had a brake drum and a fan that blew air up the bottom and you'd get some coal, set a fire in there and you could bring it up to about 
two or 3,000 degrees. And so I could take coil springs that I found from old, you know, junker cars in Detroit, heat them up, bend them, hammer on them until I could make tools. And then after you make the tools, then the next step is actually making what you want to make. The Craft and Hobby Association puts jewelry making at $1.4 billion in revenue for 2010. What happened next? You were just probably having fun, right? Oh, I was having a lot of fun. And I was working in the restaurant, and I ended up moving into here, working out of this shop. We hired a waitress at, at the, the restaurant, and I had a little bit of a crush on her. Yeah. And she had a wooden ring collection. And so one day I came back to the shop and was chopping firewood and was just like, you know what? That's a really cool knot. I could make her a ring. That would be a nice little little in. And so nothing came from that, but all the other waitresses wanted to know where their wooden rings were. And so made a bunch for all the waitresses I worked with. And then, you know, there were some really cool pieces that were too small. So I ended up making a necklace and then making some earrings. And then from that, our customers would come in and ask where all the waitresses got their jewelry. Started with a cross. <laughs> Who says that chivalry is dead? That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's an incredible story. If that girl wasn't there and you weren't there, you may not have made that ring. Yeah. Who knows it's, what would have happened? I ended up selling a lot of stuff online. Uh, I ended up getting a few wholesale deals. Uh, I went to New York City for a martial arts conference. And while I was in New York, I brought a backpack full of my jewelry and wandered from the airport to Manhattan walked 28 miles that day, just stopped at any little boutique, opened up the bag and asked them if they'd want to sell it. With the boutiques, it opened up the idea that instead of just doing art fairs, I could do wholesale. Did the business become sustainable to your life, to your lifestyle and everything? It's been three years as an S Corp and now I have a, a real estate business in addition to the gym, in addition to the art business. I was able to buy a building down the street um, that I used to drive by every day on my way to work. Yeah and tell myself, if I won the lottery one day, I'm gonna buy that building, open a gym, and make art, and that'll be my life. And uh, I didn't win the lottery, but I was able to, to hustle a little bit and yeah. make it work. 56% of U.S. households crafted at least once during 2010, contributing to the $29.2 billion U.S. craft and hobby industry. What's your total financial investment in this operation, the woodworking operation? All in all, probably, you know, thousand dollars. Total. Oh yeah. In business. Oh yeah. And it's it is it is profitable. Oh yeah. One of the nice things is I try and use mostly local stuff that I get for free. So material cost is almost nothing. And it's just time, energy, and focus and design that that's what gives everything it's worth. So are you, are you able to keep up with supply? I am, uh, mostly because, again, I got really good at being efficient. Yeah. And so I'll spend an eight hour day in the shop and just crank out pieces. What percentage of your business is e-commerce? And then what has the impact of social media been for you? Uh, social media, I haven't seized on as much as I should. Uh, the internet presence is actually getting a little bigger. I'm getting a little more press. And so the e-commerce right now, I probably depending on fares, uh, 50%. What advice do you have for other entrepreneurs out there? People that just want to do what they've always loved, but they're scared. Stay flexible, uh, a big thing. Like stretching? <laughs> Stay flexible with your plan. Okay. Um, to always do what you love, because that's why you're getting in business by yourself anyway. If right. you can. You can do something you hate for someone else, don't do something you hate for yourself. So don't let your job <laughs> right. turn into that. Thanks a lot, man. Oh, really appreciate pleasure. hearing Thank your story. You. We all have the ability to create the perfect life. And for Berkey, I think he's already there. But first, you gotta stop pining about what you can and cannot do and start whittling away at your dream. It just might grow roots faster than you think. For more information, log on to our website and click the link for Four Chamber Forge. The secret of hiring great people is to understand that you're really looking for two very, very different things. You're looking for technical skills because you need people who are really, really good at what they do. And you need emotional skills because you need people who love providing hospitality. And they're very, very different things. If I were the general manager of a baseball team, I'd be looking for, for people who have great hitting or fielding or pitching statistics, but I'd also be looking for people who I want to hang out with in the dugout because it's the character of who you are on the team 
that it's even more important than what you know how to do. Next time on Startup, I'm going to Washington, D.C. to meet with Roger and Brian, who created Pleasant Pops, the one-stop shop that uses all natural ingredients and has locals coming back for more. Then I'm going to Chicago to meet with Phil, who started Dojo, a creative agency that calls themselves the startup of startups. And then I'm going to Detroit to talk to Di and Jessica, a husband and wife team who own and operate Astro Coffee, a hip single drip brew coffee house with in-house baked goods. Be sure to join us next time on Startup. Visit our website at startup-usa.com and like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. What, what, uh, what do you call organic food? What did they call organic food in 1950? No idea. Food. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. The entrepreneurial spirit is alive and well. In Walsh College's business launch entrepreneurial community, consultants provide advice to aspiring business starters. More information available online. The Chevrolet Volt, an everyday electric car with gas for longer trips. The nature of things to come. Chevrolet, find new roads. American Express is proud to support Startup and the millions of small businesses that put in the hard work to be open for business in neighborhoods across the country.